Hello friends, it's time once again to talk about the last few books I've been reading, and our theme today is big data. How do we gather data? How do we interpret data? How do we create information as we perceive it? How can that lead us philosophically astray? And the first book I want to share with you is Evgeny Morozov, To Save Everything, Click Here. This book is very, very rich, it's very, very dense, it's got a lot going on. It's, I, I, if I were to describe it broadly, I would say it's about the philosophy of technology, but it packs a heck of a lot else in besides. In particular, there's some really cool sections on historiography and how we do the history of technology. There's a fantastic bit about the printing press, which inspired my video, is YouTube like the printing press, which you may have seen. There's some really excellent stuff about openness and transparency. What do those mean? Are they always good things? I would agree with Morozov that sometimes we run the risk of fetishizing openness and transparency and thinking that they are ends in themselves rather than means. Surely the end of making a government or, or a power structure more open and transparent is so that we can more, can more easily change it. Whereas what he highlights is sometimes people are very keen on saying, yes, we're very open and very transparent, but like not actually giving you any way to affect what's going on. In that way, it reminded me a little bit of a, a point that Sarah Ahmed made in her book, The Cultural Politics of Emotion, where she talks about how some organizations will publish their racial diversity statistics and then say, aren't we very good? Aren't we very woke publishing all our racial diversity statistics? And she says, uh, yeah, I mean, that's cool, but like, that's not enough because the statistics say that your organization is like really not diverse at all and you need to actually do something about it. She talks about um, the documenting of the problem as a substitute for actually tackling the problem. And speaking of tackling problems, Morozov's book very much rails against what he calls solutionism. Uh, which is the tendency often involving technology to think that all problems can definitely be solved and have an absolutely precise technical solution. If only we can get the right algorithms, if only we can get the right computer systems and structures, then we can definitely solve 100% all the problems of politics or economics or whatever. And what he cautions is that actually, no, some problems cannot be solved. Some problems can only be approached, and our approach will have positives and negatives, and will necessarily be ambiguous and have unpredictable results. I also really enjoyed the bits about if you create a tool or a piece of technology, you presuppose the conditions that make that tool necessary as the creator of the tool envisioned them. For instance, we can imagine, uh, let's say that we, we create an app and we pitch it to the city, we say, we've created this app, and uh, it, it monitors uh, how, how much space there are in homeless shelters and tells homeless people like where's a nearby shelter and how much space they have and how much it's gonna be, right? It's, it's gonna help homeless people get off the streets for the night. Brilliant, technological solution to homelessness. But actually, if we do push that solution, solution, inverted commas, then we are presupposing the conditions that make people homeless in the first place, and not just presupposing them, but actually not challenging them. Because I'm somebody who spends a lot of time on the internet and, and makes at least a huge part of my living on the internet, uh, this book was really challenging to me. Not not challenging in the sense that it's difficult to read because it's actually very accessible, but challenging in the sense that it really like made me stop and think about what I was doing. In particular, my, my series, The Philosophy of YouTube, which you might have seen a few episodes of, it really made me challenge how I approached that, especially the section on historiography and how we talk about the internet. It was given to me from my wish list of books by Stephen Wuchina, a fan of the show. Thank you very much, Stephen. It has been an eye-opening read. Next up, an absolute cracker. It was sent to me by a longtime fan of the show, Dustin Simmons. It is Deirdre McCluskey's The Rhetoric of Economics. This one's really cool. McCluskey's thesis is that science, and, and economics in particular, is or can be examined through a literary lens, that it's a mode of speech, that whilst the process of scientific investigation with experimentation and demonstration and so on is one thing, any particular conversation about science, which of course includes not just literal conversations face to face, but also scientific papers, any kind of scientific writing, is an act of persuasion and can therefore be analysed in literary terms. She goes through some of the most famous economic papers written in the 20th century and examines them with a literary lens, saying this is the metaphor they've used, this is the authorial voice they've used, this is how they're trying to persuade you here. I really enjoyed the bits about statistics and statistical significance and the way people confuse statistical significance with like significance in the sense of it's important for your life. There are some very interesting bits in here about how the rhetoric of mainstream economics and the rhetoric of Marxist economics are quite different and that's why it's difficult to put the two together because they're talking about different kinds of value which I found 
I found that very cool. Again, it's pretty accessible, it's pretty simple. There are some uh, some tables and some data, but if, if you're a kind of reader who uh, who gets a little bit of, oh, lots of tables and data, uh, then don't worry, you're in good company. I sometimes get like that too, and it's not it's not totally dry and, and too bad. It's actually like pretty entertaining in places. So again, thoroughly recommend it. Last but not least, Dorothy Roberts' Fatal Invention. The book is about the concept of race and how that concept is used in medicine in pharmacology and in the surveillance industry. This has a lot of very detailed case studies. It really goes into depth on, on like the studies and the data and so on, which I really enjoyed. It was nice to have that detail. She talks about DNA testing companies like 23andMe, you might have seen those, where you can send your DNA away and they will tell you like what percentage of Asian genes, what percentage of white genes you have, all inverted commas, which presumes, she explains, the existence of some kind of pure person who would be 100% Asian genes, which of course no such person exists and, and never has, rather than the more accurate way of saying it, which would be, you have these genes which are statistically more commonly found in, but not exclusive to, people who, for historical and political reasons about courtesans and statutes from that period of history, we have decided for now to give this name. Again, rather like Morozov says, we create a tool, in this case racial categories, and in creating it we presume that the world is a certain way and can only be approached in a way that would make that tool useful. That sort of thing comes up again in the section on pharmaceuticals, which again I found really fascinating. Uh, an example she gives is uh, if we assume wrongly or better yet, if we design some slightly dodgy study to try and show that black kids are genetically more predisposed to asthma, then we open up a massive market there of marketing and selling asthma drugs to people of colour and black kids. Whereas, it would be a lot more challenging and not nearly as profitable to start looking at things like why do certain neighbourhoods where there are proportionally higher numbers of black kids have more airborne irritants which might contribute to asthma and to start examining the kind of social issues around that. Again, once we invent a tool, then we can sometimes stop ourselves from seeing a different take on the problem that that tool was designed to address. It's not just uh, genetics and science though, there's some really good stuff about history here. I really enjoyed the bits about how, uh, how racial categories were just invented, like the category, the legal category of, of Asian was invented in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, just sort of created out of thin air by uh, statutes and by court decisions in order to regulate who could and couldn't come into the United States. So it was really interesting to hear about that history. It was fascinating to hear about the history of American eugenics as well. I also really enjoyed the bits about DNA evidence, which uh, I have to say, just as a layperson, I assumed that DNA evidence was like pretty bulletproof if you can bring it up in court, but it's actually not. She goes through all sorts of cases where she says, look, this is where the DNA evidence was misidentified. This is where somebody's DNA was harvested and there was a mistake made or just somebody like labeled the wrong vial. Like it can go wrong. And what that means is if your DNA is on a government database, there is a chance, however small, that it will come up as a false positive. If they've got DNA from a crime scene and they're running it through the genetic database to just see if they can get a, a cold hit, uh, and your DNA happens to be on the database, then there's a greater chance of you getting a false positive coming up and saying you were involved in this crime, of course, than if your DNA was never on that database. Which makes it all the more alarming, she says, that some states and some states, like American small states and some states big states, as in state government, are gathering DNA from people who haven't actually even been convicted of a crime, who haven't even been charged with a crime or arrested, just people who are like being routinely stopped by the police are having like fingerprints taken, having DNA taken. She's saying it's really worrying that they're building up this database of DNA when actually it isn't as, as nearly as bulletproof as everybody thinks it is. So of course, for instance, if you are uh, a local or a national law enforcement agency and you are disproportionately arresting people of color, then their DNA is disproportionately gonna end up in the system and therefore they are disproportionately gonna be affected by false positives on cold hits. This book came uh, from Vespere Sebastian Oaks, another big fan of the show. Thank you very much. It was kind of disturbing and scary, but yeah, 
really good. I'll put links in the doobly-doo where you can pick up all of these books if you want to check them out, and a link to my wish list if you ever want to get me some research material for the show. If you've been watching the show recently, you'll have seen some themes from all three of these books coming up and appearing in it, so you, you can really sort of affect the way the next few episodes of Philosophy Tube go, depending on like what I've been reading lately. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next thing that I make. Bye! Patreon.com slash Philosophy Tube is what allows me to pay my rent and afford food if you'd like to see me making more of the show and remaining alive, then you can sign up to give a monthly donation there if you are very generous indeed. 